Since time immemorial, people have wondered where they come from, where they're going, and who they are. Humankind has reinvented the world again and again, always believing in the possibility of a better future. 500 years ago, Martin Luther started the Reformation, transforming the way people worshipped and thought. Today, we're standing at another crossroads. Sometimes I wonder, is everything we're experiencing right now happening because a new era is dawning? Europe in jeopardy, all the crises. Is something unusual going on? Or do we just see it as extreme because we're in the middle of it? It all feels so awful, but actually, life is incredible, beautiful, a miracle. That's reason enough to carry on. I feel like I can make the world a better place just by being happy myself. At some point, we'll probably go too far. We usually only realize that, though, when it's too late. It's only when you've crossed that line that you realize you've gone too far. We've pushed physics to the limit of what is humanly imaginable and are well on our way to finding the biological origins of man. Luther's Reformation introduced us to the concept of personal freedom. But despite the Enlightenment, man is still driven by primal instincts. The genocides of the 20th century showed us that there is still only a thin line separating man from beast. They were deeply shocking. Ever since, reason has been the backbone of the European project. We know that we can only ensure a safe future for ourselves if we are a community. Are we all egoists at heart? Are we basically indifferent to our fellow humans in the state of the world? Not all of us. Many people feel a responsibility to the world around them and actively seek to improve it. Some even do so for a living, for example, as politicians. Brussels, the epicenter of European politics. 766 members of the European Parliament work here on behalf of the 500 million plus citizens of the 28 states that make up the EU. The essence of the European Union is growing together, working together, and transcending borders and long-standing obstacles. Ska Keller is serving her second term in the world's biggest democratically elected parliament. I grew up on a border, the German-Polish border. For a long time, you couldn't cross it without showing your passport. There were always long lines of people waiting to cross. But now the border's open. There are no more controls. You just cross the Nysa River and that's it. To me, the fact that we in Europe can cross borders easily is enormously important. Countess Berta Kinski von Vichinitz und Tetau lived in Vienna at a time when the idea of a strong nation-state was gaining traction and countries across Europe were rapidly building up military power. After Berta's father died, her mother gambled away the family's entire fortune. In 1873, poverty-stricken Berta took a job as a governess to the daughters of the wealthy industrialist Karl von Suttner. She fell in love with Artur, the elder brother of her charges, a man who was seven years her junior. Their relationship was scandalous. Berta lost her job. She applied for a new position in Paris. Well-heeled elderly gentleman from Sweden seeks a lady with language skills as a secretary for his business in Paris. Please write to Alfred Nobel. It was a time of accelerated change. Progress was inexorable. 
Not even the image that people had had of their world since the mid-19th century was static. The world's first movie screening took place in 1895. A moving walkway at the World's Fair in 1900 in Paris. The world was enthralled to the idea of speed. Technology was taking off. In 1901, a suspension railway was unveiled in Wuppertal. It's still in operation today. When you read old books, you realize that people have often thought they were witnessing the dawn of a new era, that everything was about to change, or already had. Maybe change always seemed as radical as the change we're witnessing today. I'm not sure if we're on the brink of a new era. Europeans marveled at technological progress, with a sense of pride, but also with a sense of astonishment. Seeing the world from a bird's eye point of view, it was both exciting and unnerving. Suddenly, it was possible to travel to distant shores. People were confident that new inventions would make the world a better place. But then, disaster struck and undermined this conviction. The sinking of the Titanic in 1912 was a turning point, not an act of God, but a tragedy brought about by man's own hand and hubris. This was a result of man's conquest of the world with technology. You can learn from mistakes. The Titanic shouldn't have hit an iceberg, and if it had been built better, it wouldn't have sunk. It wasn't something that renewed religious anxiety. But faith was also changing. The very first film about Martin Luther was made in Germany in the early 20th century. It depicted him as a modernizer, a reformer. He was used to demonstrate how the German conscience could protect against enemies. The man who posited that all believers have direct access to God had become an icon of Imperial Germany. Luther was a key reference point for the German Empire envisaged by Wilhelm II. For Kaiser Wilhelm II, Luther was a touchstone. The version of Christianity he wanted to see across Germany was Lutheran Protestant. He was anti-Catholic, of course. And Luther was the ultimate crusader against Catholicism. Wilhelm wanted the new German Empire to be on an equal footing with the world powers of England and the United States. Berlin evolved into a Protestant city. Under Wilhelm II, ten years were spent renovating the cathedral. Its dome was even bigger than the cupola of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. 400 years after the Reformation, Germans saw themselves as the anointed people. Technology, power, and faith went hand in hand. Evolution chooses the right path. Nature tries out hundreds of thousands of things by chance and then sticks to the one that works best. Then it tries out all sorts of other things and chooses the best again. It's all about chance, but it's systematic too. Alexander Blesle is a triathlete. He likes to push himself to his limits. These are his zebrafish. 
As part of his research at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology at the University of Tübingen, Alexander is trying to find out how the cells in fish embryos decide what part of the organism they'll become. You can ask me, what would this cell evolve into? And I can tell you, it'll be skin cells on an arm. Or in the case of a fish, a fin. We can do that. But what we want to understand is, how does the cell know what to evolve into? Alexander is working on his PhD. One day, his research on cell differentiation might help find a cure for cancer. For now, he's looking into the early foundations of life. You have to forge ahead with your research until you know you've gone too far. You never know you're crossing that threshold when you're doing it. You can debate the issue with a thousand people, and everyone will have their own threshold. Ever since the Renaissance, humankind has been pushing boundaries, remapping the world, and declaring itself the measure of all things. But in the distant future, robots might take over as the rulers of the world. So if a robot one day will design the DNA of a human being, whose fault will that be? If not the politicians, the scientists, the citizens, all the people who should not have done that in the first place. There is something about technology which is too late. It's like taking a train. Once you're on the train, you need to wait for the next station. Taking that train? That's up to you. <laughs> Is a second always a second? A meter always a meter? In the early 20th century, Albert Einstein began looking for an equation that could explain everything, from the laws of physics governing the universe to man's place in it. Within just 10 years, Einstein developed his two theories of relativity and became world famous. His name has become synonymous with genius. Even though the idea that time and space can bend didn't fit into an empirical worldview, his theories embedded themselves in the collective consciousness. Einstein was great because uh, he had this um, depth an intuition which was not driven by experiments. He had a, um, an amazing imagination and vision, and uh, he worked out this theory just uh, by himself. He proposed something completely new, um, a geometric view of gravitation that was not there before. It was really something that he conceived in his mind, which makes really Einstein one of the, if not the greatest scientist ever. Einstein didn't believe in God, but he was in awe of the mysteries of the cosmos. Only recently, one of these was detected in a sensational find. In 2015, an international team of physicists was able to prove that Einstein's gravitational waves exist. At the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, Alessandra Bonanno developed a model that shows how a collision of black holes causes gravitational waves. The waves uh, are like um, uh, fingerprints. They have information encoded uh, of the properties of the source that has emitted them. It's like to have a new telescope. And it will be great if going more into the future, maybe the next, you know, um, 10, 20 years, even more, uh, we could actually access um, signals that come directly from the Big Bang, from when the universe formed. I made one great mistake in my life. 
when I signed the letter to President Roosevelt recommending that atom bombs be made. But there was some justification, the danger that the Germans would make them. In August 1945, the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one of the most terrible catastrophes in the history of mankind. It might sound kitschy, but I believe in human goodness. The reason I believe in it is because if I didn't, I would end up paranoid. I believe that all humans are good at heart. Otherwise, every time we met someone, we would have to ask, is this person good or evil? Good or evil? Without awareness of good and evil, without an ego that assumes responsibility, human coexistence would fall apart. This is the definition not only maybe of the ego, but of a, of a moral ego, of a, I mean, uh, an ego that has an agency, that has an authorship, that can say, I, and this I knows who he is, knows what he does in the world, and knows who uh, uh, she is accountable to, and has principles that she can refer back to in herself. Countess Batakinsky arrived in Paris in 1876 and began working as Alfred Nobel's secretary. She soon realized her boss was an incredibly wealthy arms manufacturer, a chemist and an inventor who loved to experiment with explosives. There is nothing worse than war. But your fortune depends on it. If we had a weapon whose power to destroy was such that it could wipe out humanity, then there would be no more wars. Such as your dynamite, the only solution is to abolish weapons altogether. The right thing to do is to take responsibility, because if we don't, who will? When it came to taking responsibility in the Nazi era, people just passed the buck with a shocking unanimity. They just said, it's nothing to do with me. I was just following orders. The responsibility lies with others. I never wanted all those people to die. Why should I be held responsible? I'm just one of many. Many people think, oh, that's the past and we learned our lesson. It won't ever happen again. But we need to be vigilant and not believe that just because all those images look old and black and white, that it couldn't happen today. The hatred, the ostracism. Democracy and human rights are something we need to uphold, need to keep fighting for. Ska Keller comes from Brandenburg. She was just 27 when she won her first seat as a member of the Green Party in the European Parliament in 2009. I've been interested in politics for as long as I can remember. I first began getting involved when I was about 13 in issues such as animal rights and then against racism in my hometown. That's how I got into politics. Ska became a politician because she felt a responsibility to society. She stayed true to her principles. If you ask me what it is that people uh, uh, desire today, I would say 
that will and desire are precisely one of the things that are deeply problematic in co the contemporary world at this moment. Um, so, whereas I think 50 years ago, people had strong urges and desires and the problem was, will they have the courage to go through with these desires? Today is, what are these desires at all? I can be anything, I can do anything. Therefore, what it is really that I want to do or be. After returning to Vienna from Paris in 1876, Bata secretly married the love of her life, Otto von Zutna. It was wonderful to be in a new country and rediscover the world together with Arthur. I read Charles Darwin's book. We humans are also in a constant state of evolution and are gradually transforming from warring savages into peaceful and refined beings. Disowned by Arthur's wealthy family, the couple settled in the Caucasus. They lived from the money Arthur made writing about the Russo-Turkish War. Why do you not write about what moves you? You are far better than I am at describing how justice could make the world a better place. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that it will consume me, Arthur. We must not lose one another again. Berta began a correspondence with Alfred Nobel, discussing issues such as the horror of war. The dead are everywhere, plundered, some naked, and just the same with the wounded. They look pale, collapsed, with a fixed and stupefied gaze. Like Artur, Nobel encouraged Berta to write down her thoughts and opinions. She had already begun earning small sums writing romantic stories. We all have aggression inside ourselves. We all have what it takes to hurt others. But just imagine if we all made it mankind's primary goal to contain this aggression and reduce it as much as possible. Biologist Alexander Blesley is on his way to his zebrafish. Today he's planning to examine fertilized fish eggs, research that also has implications for humans. Should we treat disease or is that intervening in a natural process? How far can we go to cure people? Is it okay that people live to be 80 or 90? Should we deny anyone over 90 medical help and say, well, cancer is nature's way of asserting itself. Tough luck. We're too egotistical and have too much empathy to go that far. Alexander injects the egg cells with a contrast agent. This allows him to observe what happens to the proteins released by the cells. A lot of people draw the line at humans, but why can we experiment on animals and not humans, especially when it comes to embryonic development? An embryo has no consciousness, it doesn't think. It's got the same level of intelligence as my fish. So why can't I carry out research on it? Just because the church, at least the Catholic church, argues that it's life. Great. The embryos I'm experimenting on are also life. That argument doesn't wash with me. It's biology. There's no God behind it, at least in my opinion. I draw the line personally at inflicting pain. I won't go there. That is for me a no-go.
Eventually, Otto's parents forgave the couple and gave them Harmansdorf Palace north of Vienna. Here they found peace, and Bata began work on her book. No sensible person would dream of tackling an ink stain with ink, an oil stain with oil. But blood, they always seek to wash away with more blood. I read dense historical tracts, browsed newspapers and archives in search of reports filed by war correspondents and military doctors. I listened to soldiers' accounts of fighting. My abhorrence of war grew painfully intense. The work progressed slowly. Banta was discouraged. She was still searching for a title for her book. Then she found inspiration in a lead from Schubert's Winter Journey. Lay down your arms. Faisen is the son of Iranian immigrants. He's been rapping in German since he was a teenager. I've always doubted my art. I always have and I always will. I always ask myself if anyone's really interested, if there's a point to it. Maybe I should get a sensible job and look after a family. Wouldn't that be better? Do I have my head in the clouds? Negative thoughts like that have always gone through my head. But at one point I just thought, hey, make a decision. And so I decided music was worth it. I can make the world a better place with music. Und wenn ich keins mehr hab, frage ich mich und leis mir selbst. Denn ich kenn da draußen keine Welt, die nicht in tausend Teile fällt, wenn's um ein voller Neid ist, wenn man etwas auf die Beine stellt. Hier in meiner eigenen Welt, in meinem Paradies. Lay Down Your Arms was published in 1889. It took Banta a while to find a publisher willing to take on the anti-war novel. But it touched a nerve. By the time the First World War had begun, it had been translated into more than a dozen languages and published in at least 37 editions. Banta von Zutna was famous, even though her detractors derided her pacifist views. Mein lieber Nobel. My dear Alfred Nobel, we are in all likelihood about to lose our home. Hamansdorf is to be sold. It is such a misfortune. Berta never earned much from her novel despite its success. Hamansdorf Palace went to rack and ruin. The European Parliament is debating how best to distribute refugees across the bloc. Sweden says it's already taken in enough and cannot take any more. Ska Keller argues that there should be no exceptions and has requested a vote. 
this Europäischen Parlament ist immer noch die. The European Parliament is still the institution demonstrating the most solidarity and pushing for a fair distribution of refugees across Europe. The problem is with national governments, even though they know the situation on the ground and must realize that closing borders and erecting fences is no solution. What's at stake here are the lives of families, young children, refugees. Anyone might find themselves having to flee for their lives. It should be obvious to all of us that these people need help. It's a stalemate. There will have to be more lengthy debates before another vote can take place. By the end of the day, the cells that Alexander marked should have divided multiple times and produced enough protein for him to take the next step. No, I just hope that the embryo is the right one. Oh no, no. we might have lost our embryo. That would be seriously crappy. In 1904, Bertha von Suttner, now famous all over the world, went on a reading tour of the U.S. and also took part in the World Peace Congress. She kept a diary of her trip. Financial worries continued to plague her. By now, she was widowed. Harmansdorf had been sold off. Whenever she wasn't traveling, she lived in a modest apartment in Vienna. Flower Day in Vienna, 1905. The mood was cheerful. Bata von Zutner couldn't enjoy it. She had money troubles. But then she received a telegram. The Nobel Committee of the Norwegian Parliament has the honor of informing you that it has awarded you the Nobel Peace Prize for 1905. At the age of 62, Bertha von Suttner's financial woes were finally over. It was all worth it. It's strange. This prize is a mixed blessing. But it's wonderful. Bertha von Suttner died on the 21st of June, 1914, just one week before the lid blew off the powder keg that Europe had become. It was the first great conflict of the industrial era. Man was not just fighting man, but machine. The war lasted four years and claimed 10 million lives. In 2003, scientists announced they had sequenced all the genes of the human genome, a major step towards being able to treat incurable diseases. Might science one day help secure lasting peace on Earth? Funnily enough, I was raised Catholic. But at one point, I broke with the church. I still like churches, though. It sounds silly, given that I'm not religious at all. But I actually think churches are amazing. Very spiritual buildings. I'd love to visit a huge Gothic cathedral and just think and reflect. Sometimes I take a book and read there. Those are some of the rare occasions when I don't listen to music, when I can really calm down, and it's great. But the actual church and me, we're not really friends anymore. Film became a mass medium. Cinema became the 20th century's definitive form of entertainment.
Once Hitler seized power in 1933, the Nazis used film as a tool of propaganda. As a medium, it was tailor-made for their brand of demagoguery. On May 10, 1933, a series of book burnings took place in cities across Germany as Nazis called for boycotts of Jewish businesses. What began as hate speech eventually led to the murder of millions. Four hundred years earlier, Martin Luther published his work on the Jews and their lies. Such a desperate, thoroughly evil, poisonous, and devilish lot are these Jews, he wrote, and proposed that Jewish synagogues and schools be set on fire. In 1933, just under two-thirds of Germans were Protestant, one-third Catholic. The Protestant church was effusive in its declarations of loyalty to Hitler and support for his appointment as vice chancellor. Hitler had great difficulty selling his extreme racism. To the liberal, enlightened middle classes, Jews were colleagues, friends, fellow scientists and academics. So in order to make his racist policies palatable to Germany's Protestants, Nazi propaganda referred to Luther. If the church father Martin Luther said it, it must be right. This was the line taken in an almost grotesque way right up until the Nuremberg trials. Julius Streicher said, it shouldn't be me seated here, but Luther. Luther also made these statements. In that respect, his was a fatal legacy that's extremely tricky to deal with. Luther might have been a major influence on the Nazi movement, but he was also a key figure to its opponents. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of the resistance movement against the Hitler dictatorship. The most famous representative of the Confessing Church drew strength from Luther's steadfastness in the face of injustice. Who am I? They often tell me I step out of my cell looking composed and contented, like a lord from his manor. Am I what others tell me? Whoever I am, you know me. I am yours, O oh Lord. Bonhoeffer accused the Protestant church, Luther's church, of tolerating repression, hatred, and murder. The church, he said, had failed to voice support for the vulnerable or come to their aid. To be pious is to be political, through violent resistance if need be. His conscience simply would not allow him to do anything but oppose these terrible mass murderers, the Nazis. This is a standpoint that is steady and consistent. Obstinacy. Luther was often called obstinate. When it really came down to it, he swore by life and limb, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, God help me. And he survived. Bonhoeffer didn't. He gave his life. Various Nazi officials had long considered Bonhoeffer a thorn in their side. In April 1943, he was finally arrested after helping to smuggle a small group of Jews out of Germany. Two years later, he was transferred to the Flossenburg concentration camp. Then, on April 5, 1945, Hitler ordered the execution of all imprisoned resistance fighters, including Bonhoeffer. At dawn on the 9th of April, he was led from his cell to the gallows. The war ended just weeks later, 
long after the Nazis had given up any hope of victory. The Nazis murdered millions of Jews. They also killed countless others, people who opposed their regime, homosexuals, people with disabilities, Sinti and Roma, and forced laborers from all over the world. How could life go on after such atrocities? How could faith in humanity be restored? Europe managed to rise from the ashes in one of the most extraordinary achievements of the 20th century. What started out in the 1950s as the European Economic Community had evolved by 1992 into the European Union, and with that came the longest ever period of peace in Europe's history. Recently, I pulled an all-nighter, and at one point I had this flash of optimism. And I had this idea that it would be really amazing to all meet online and count to three and just stop. Stop everything that makes us feel guilty. Stop thinking, oh, it makes no difference what I do. Lay down your weapons. Tell everyone. Everyone. I'm optimistic about the future because that's how I tend to see things. People are becoming more open to one another and that will help us solve the problems we're facing. And solve them not as individual countries, but together, as a global community.